learning doesn't stop when we leave school. It's what breaks the cycle of poverty and helps us reach our goals. That's why at Rumi, we're making learning as accessible, interactive, and easy as social media. Enter Rumi Learn, the front page of learning. It's a library of free micro-learning courses called Bytes that uses data and AI to create a personalized experience. Each bite is less than 10 minutes long and builds the types of transferable life and career skills that are key to success. But we're not doing it alone. Corporate partners and community volunteers use our rapid authoring platform to build bites, transforming insights into a format that's designed for modern learners. We work with distribution partners like internet service providers and community groups to meet learners where they already are, like while using public Wi-Fi, waiting for a bus or their laundry. So we use connectivity for good and nudge our communities to scroll with purpose. Hello and welcome to New Year, New Lessons. I'm Steve Birick. I'm the content producer here at Rumi. It's our first celebration of Rumi's impact. Thank you so much, whether you're board members, donors, partners, volunteers, members of the learning community, or anyone just interested in Rumi's mission. In general, we're really grateful for your support and your involvement. It's played a huge part in Rumi reaching over 550,000 learners since our inception and counting. We have a learning library of over 1300 bytes created by over 250 volunteers with the help of 10 plus partnerships. We've got a great group of speakers lined up to celebrate what we accomplished together in 2021. We're gonna look as well at the impact of Rumi's presence on learners around the world and how Rumi will play a role in the future of learning for 2022 and beyond. So without further ado, I'd like to bring in Tarek Fancy, our CEO and founder, and Bogdan Arseny, our CTO, to talk about 2021 and all that we accomplished. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. We're really excited to have you here with us today. I'm going to try to kick it off without getting too much into detail or boring anyone to death. I'm just by giving sort of a 500-foot view of, you know, sort of what we're doing and what's the mission behind Rumi and how we've gotten to a point where today, you know, you might say that, um, you know, someone, a, a young person in Kansas City, there's no reason why he or she shouldn't get the same quality of learning as a kid in Palo Alto or on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is correct. And what we'll show you today is sort of how we've built an engine to do that. And I was doing it around the world, and it's also extending it to the girl in Kandahar, right, or, or people in the most remote places who, if you have the basic infrastructure elements of technology today, which is you know, some level of connection and some level of device, which now billions do, that can become a lifeline to learning. But it's not going to be the same learning that you've always seen, right? I mean, it's not uh, it's not just grabbing what we had and putting a video on your phone and you do the exact same thing. It has to be adapted to the form factor, um, to the culture, to all of the different contextual pieces that make uh, learning really what it is and, and successful for different people in a way that's truly learner centric and, and, and built in a bottoms up way. But to kick it off first, I'll give you a quick, quick background on Rumi so you understand the, the mission and the organization. Because for those of you who have followed us for years, you might have noticed that we've evolved in what we're doing in the nearly 10 years since we were founded. And that's all was really built out of the founding mission of using technology in uh, a creative way to solve problems that hadn't been solved before. So we we started in 2013. Um, some of you may know the founding story, which is that I had spent a long career working in financial services. Um, for those of you who know me really well, that was not uh, my dream in life. It was came out of the end of undergrad and sort of like any of us, you stumble into uh, something in front of you. And I spent uh, years doing uh, investment banking in the tech sector in Silicon Valley. And besides obviously seeing the kind of innovation that was possible in that era, right, work, working with companies then Google, who was pre-IPO and other ones, you know, I remember also looking at Wikipedia and thinking to myself, like, this is fascinating, right? Here you have an organization that is a nonprofit, 
but it's not doing the traditional nonprofit thing, which is saying, you know, the, the advantage we get out of 501c3 status or registered charity status is that, you know, we can um, give a charity receipt or tax receipt to someone. They were using it in a novel way of saying that we can build a movement of people around the world who can collaborate with technology in a way that's truly meaningful. And, um, and in my case, I, I had this deep passion for education coming out of the family history, which is, uh, you know, my mother's family had eight siblings. It's a big family. One of them who uh, was the really the most intelligent and, and, and really capable of them was unable to get an education because, you know, he, he had a disability. And uh, in the 1960s in Nairobi, there was no uh, accessible school bus or other sorts of, of infrastructure to, to allow for him to truly realize his potential. And it always stuck with me that, you know, years later, he had he passed due to medical complications. The idea that there's so many people around there in, in the world, for whatever reason, whether it's that they have a disability or it's where they're born or it's their gender, they don't get the same quality of access. And um, and that really pushed me to start Rumi um, at one point. And, and, and the emotional push was really that my closest friend and roommate in business school uh, had um, contracted stage four cancer. He now had a, this great passion to do something for the world um, that was more than uh, investment banking. And um, and uh, and I followed in his footsteps after watching his example, which is that he contracted stage four cancer. Uh, realized it was no longer a question of, you know, someday I'll do something. It was now or never. And while fight, fighting stage four melanoma, uh, his name was Michiel. He was a blonde haired blue eyed Dutch guy. And he went to uh, to Kenya, where my family had immigrated from and um, and created an organization to this day is doing excellent work around using play to inspire education. And that pushed me to say, well, I've been lucky in life. And, and this is an idea that I think actually can have tremendous impact if we if we do it well. And that began the Rumi story. And, you know, the one thing that has sort of flown through all of what we've done over the years is um, is the idea that we are structured as a nonprofit, right? We People can trust us that our only bottom line is to help them, you know, make learning easy, fun, and accessible. Um, but we also, within that, have a true startup culture, right? We went through um, something called Y Combinator, this incubator in Silicon Valley, and piece by piece, we built a culture around trying things uh, rather than just theorizing only, right? Um, getting into the field, learning by doing, and most of all, uh, most importantly, really a, a bottoms up approach where we said that, you know, we really need to listen to the learner, right? Um, because you'd find an international development, we were working abroad, you'd find sort of people deciding that this is what someone in Africa wants um, rather than asking the person themselves and empowering them with the ability to, to, to chart their own destiny. And you find that broadly across education is that very often it's top down. And that works if you have a captive audience, right? If you have a someone in a classroom and there's a 60 minute lecture, uh, they can't get bored and dive out the window seven minutes in. Uh, what I think everyone has learned, even in rich countries in the last two years, is that when you take that experience and you move it uh, onto a device and you ask the kid you know, to, to watch the video on their device in their bedroom, uh, you know, you don't have a captive audience and seven minutes in, if the kid's bored, I guarantee you that the TikTok notification that appears on their phone is probably going to be more attractive um, and steal their attention. And so that's sort of driven the approach around Rumi, which is a learner centric approach that over time has moved from where we started, which was very much around access, right? Building a bridge for, you know, the least served communities to show that even when there were not in the early days, devices and faster internet connections, all of which has improved over the last 10 years, um, you know, you could bring these tools and, uh, and, and really make a massive step change in learning for kids. And so we began doing a lot of things uh, globally. Um, I remember stories of <clears throat> like one kid in Liberia, a guy called Lawrence, who had dropped out of school and, and just seeing the, the ability to use technology to learn really um, galvanized. Him. And now to where we are, which is really focusing much more on engagement, right? That's the mini missing piece is that if you can truly engage learners in a meaningful way, you can, um, you know, you can have far more impact because it's something that people really want to do. And so we'll talk a lot about micro learning in the next, um, you know, hour or so. Um, but I'll just finish by sort of saying, look, in 2021 was a breakout year, right? We had figured out finally a, a, a formula that not only drives impact, but it engages people enough that they're interested and want to do it and creates, you know, impact that can scale extremely quickly, which again is the key. If you're a technology organization, you really need to 
scale quickly to get the per unit cost down and to and to get all the benefits of of, of technology. Um, and I'd say that you know what we saw in 2021 was that number one, learners increasingly uh, want this. Right, the growth we're seeing is heavily organic. Uh, it's numbers that you don't tend to see in a nonprofit in terms of growth, um, and and all, but also is different from the average startup because we can't we can't raise lots of money and you know buy users with the goal of monetizing them. In that sense, we're like Wikipedia, right? It's you, you can't really advertise because it's a free resource and you hope people find and avail themselves of. And we're seeing that um, in spades right now with very very fast growth and demand from learners themselves. Um, you know, it's built on a really interesting and evolving understanding of the modern learner and how they learn through technology and in particular mobile devices. So you'll uh, hear some great thoughts from uh, from Nancy and Nadira on our team uh, in a few minutes on that. Um, and it just really is, it includes amazing partners, volunteers and collaborators around the world. Right. This is not really it would be I'd be remiss to say it's a technology innovation and, and not say that it's really more a movement and a platform that it's engaging people who can contribute in various ways, way, shapes and form. And so we'll have some of our, uh, our great sort of community and, and partners joining in also. And finally, I'd say just, you know, before I hand it off to our CTO blog, Dan, to give a sense for where we're going, uh, just say, look, our, our results this year, you know, last year have been really, really exciting, you know, 10 times learner growth year over year. Third party studies show that micro learning has 20 to 40% learning gains. You know, some surveys have shown that kids are actually replacing social media with it. Um, you know, it's a dopamine rush for learning something that's good for your mobile, for, for your mental health. And so really excited about the potential as it scales. Um, and I'll hand it over to uh, to Bogdan to really kind of give you a sense of, of where we're now planning to take it. Thanks. Thank you, Tarek. Hi, I'm Bogdan. And uh, as the Chief Technology Officer of Rumi, I'm thrilled to tell you about some upcoming product features and take capabilities that we're really excited about. As you know, AI has been a big topic of discussion over the past several years. Advances in natural language processing have led to some significant new developments. Specifically, the GTP3 language model by OpenAI, which we have gained access to, that allows us to explore the exciting ability to empower authors to use AI to overcome writer's block, to summarize in simpler language, create analogies, create questions, all which allow Byte authors to write more effectively, faster, and more aligned to the language needs of our learners. We're really excited for these things to come in the next few months. Another development I'm really excited about is being able to offer more personalized learning. We have learned from focusing the Rumi library on stuff you didn't learn in school, that school soft skills are very personal and are like a giant puzzle of the different skills that come together for each individual uniquely. We see our role at Rumi to give our learners the tools to discover what their individual puzzle looks like and use bytes to understand the contours and content necessary to master each of the puzzle pieces that they might be missing. To help learners better understand what their overall puzzle looks like, they need better tools to self-discover. We're going to be launching new learner interfaces to help learners discover bytes based on their individual context, such as whether they're a student, professional, newcomer, and their intended outcome from their learning needs. We'll also be launching a self-assessment tool to help learners discover the boundaries of their knowledge by testing themselves against a series of individual quizzes that point them towards the bites that can help them better grasp the topic and start their learning journey to master it. In mid-2020, during the height of the first COVID lockdown, we launched our new learning products in the Lumi library of bites you see today. Launched our, with a focus on providing tangible and fun learning value in a trusted and open digital space that was designed at its very core to be a breakthrough digital learning model centered around the needs of the modern learner. In the past year, 2021, we have worked incredibly hard to establish ways to connect Rumi to, to, and the Rumi library to learners from places they already are on mass, such as on TikTok trends and Google search results looking for information such as um, what is an NFT. Connecting to them through these mediums to address their learning needs on topics they really care about has allowed us this incredible growth in the past year. This consistent engagement to provide effective, short and fun learning has created natural pipelines for learners to discover Rumi Bytes. These pipelines are growing organically by over 50% every single month and allows us to project that we will reach over 1.5 million learners this year. Thank you. Thanks to both of you, Tarek and Bogdan, for your insights. And we'll now introduce Pashtana Durrani from Learn Afghanistan to tell you about the work we've been doing together 
as partners to increase access to education. Welcome, Pashtana. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to start with my small introduction or <clears throat> let's say I, I just got a call from a friend. She's like, are you famous when you walk on streets? Do people know you? So I just want to entertain that thought. <laughs> If you don't know me, I would like to introduce myself, apart from being self-centered. My name is Pashtana Durrani. I am a civil and political rights activist in Afghanistan. I'm the founder of um, Learn Afghanistan. It's an NGO that uh, I have established in 2018. And the main reason was, as Tariq and Bogdan and everyone at Rumi also believes in, is the fact that there is a huge difference between these worlds and the learner's world. And we need to, um, uh, like, you know, fill that gap. And we started with Afghanistan. I started with Afghanistan because I come from Afghanistan. Um, because there is this difference between actual school and learning. And my cousins who were actually part of the, this region where there were no schools, so the school could not like, you know, be established there and the government was corrupt and I had to fight the whole world to get one school in, a, in that place. But the easier part was finding a solution that works in Afghanistan, finding a solution that works uh, within the vicinity of our community, uh, where I don't have to fight the whole world to get uh, my cousin educated. So as you can see, this is the first slide, and this is a school that I remember, it's Vesa School, we are still partners with them. And these are the teachers. So these teachers are actually, um, uh, grade 12 graduates and since Afghanistan doesn't have a very high count of trained teachers and um, these teachers were like teaching girls uh, at grade 9, grade 10, grade 11 um, and so this is our first year that once we uh, partnered up with Rumi when the whole world was against her <laughs> learn and me uh, Rumi believed in me and we started with five tablets and these are the first batch of our teachers where we started training them where these girls come from backgrounds where they don't have cell phones where they haven't used a laptop FYI and um, it was very for a few of them it was very first time to hold a digital device and start working on it and now these women are pro just so you guys know and this is the very first baby step that we at Learn took with Rumi in establishing digital literacy or the Rumi Learners Ground in Kandar, a very remote school, FYI. Can you go to the next slide? So, of course, every year brings in a new challenge. And since in 2019, the challenge was how to introduce digital literacy in areas and settings where, let's say, maths teacher doesn't exist physics teachers doesn't exist. And the only traditional way of teaching is through having a teacher come to a class, write on board, read and write. And then you introduce digital literacy, which is highly visual, highly audio, and it's just different. It's interactive. The first year was amazing, but on the second year, COVID came in and um, it started becoming a challenge on once you don't have a base, but your base is very small. So even if we worked in 2019 or creating a, our base, we had to reinvent ways in interacting with our students or with our teachers and learners in 2020. And this is the batch actually that actually worked on Rumi um, videos. So what these guys would do is make videos on how to introduce uh, Rumi, but in our native languages. And Kausar sitting on my right and uh, the boys uh, uh, in in the background in the picture they actually uh, work in different languages in different dialects to introduce uh, Rumi to the uh, to the students uh, or and even teachers in different zones of Afghanistan and I remember the numbers used to go high so much and uh, I remember Tanya me and Tanya one day talking about it and it was like Afghanistan was the highest it still is the highest by the way but Afghanistan was the highest on Rumi because uh, um, like you know our learners were the highest number even more than the US and India, it was just like, you know, Indians learn everything on the internet. So I was like, oh my God, we are running from India. So that was a big thing, FYI. And we evolved that year. We introduced Rumi in our own native languages. So we came up with creative ways. We came up with funny ways, we came up with, um, more traditional, contextual, culturally correct ways in introducing a digital literacy platform into Afghanistan, into rural areas of Afghanistan through Facebook and through Instagram and using like, you know, basic tools that could be understood by the people of Afghanistan. Can we go to the next slide? 
So this is 2021, um, before Afghanistan fell, and this is the this is my favorite group, a group of students, and I have a big picture of this at my home um, because I love this group. And the girl sitting on my left is actually the uh, the funniest, but also the most confident kid that you'll meet. Um, so what we did was we had these uh, bites that we created in the start of the year with Rumi post-COVID and the schools started opening, but we also wanted to make sure that it's interactive on a level where the girls can actually learn because there is a huge digital divide between girls in Afghanistan and boys in Afghanistan that they cannot access the digital tools. So these girls were actually uh, like these girls were actually uh, getting these tablets from schools that were donated by Rumi and they were able to access these bites. So we used to teach them on these bites. And I think this was the bite where we were teaching teaching them on how to brush their teeth. And uh, the girl has to pre had to present it. There is a huge video on it. But this was the very first time that we started interacting with girls on, um, on an individual or a group level uh, on how to learn with bites, how to use bites on a seven to eight minutes uh, workshop and how to learn skills like let's say washing hands and even i'm gonna be honest there was a bite on our hand washing where you had to wash your hands but you had to also like you know do this for 20 seconds and i didn't know this <laughs> we went through covid but i didn't know this <laughs> but i learned it at this ruby bite and the girls learned with me so that was something useful for me in uh, being an adult, but then the girls learned a lot. We, so in 2021, we evolved more to a pattern of how to make sure that we fill the gap of digital divide, but also at the same time, uh, make sure that we engage with children on their level and teach them skills that might be useful to them on that uh, uh, specific level. Can we go to the next slide? So now I know you guys have probably questions like, okay, you worked in 2019, 2020, and uh, you guys were good at it. What happened post that? Post that, Afghanistan fell in, uh, on August 15, and um, everything that we worked with, we had around 7,000 students, 23 schools. 18 of them were public, and all of them used Rumi as a platform for CV, for resume building, for cover letter, for interaction, how to take an interview, how to talk to people, how to network, how to create Gmail. But then everything fell apart in August and um, sometimes it's very hard to talk about this side of the uh, political crisis in Afghanistan. But also at the same time, it also shattered a lot of dreams for a lot of my students and us. And um, so we, we post August, of course, for one month I was paralyzed. I didn't even understand how to begin with or how to function or how how to even start. But after one month, I had to reach out again to Tanya. And I was like, yeah, we want to start learning again and we need your help. So in the midst of all this chaos, Rumi already had donated around 320 tablets to learn and they were sitting in Kandar. What we did was we took those tablets, the tablets and we established two schools. So as you can see, we have two schools right now in Afghanistan that those are both secret schools in secret locations in different provinces of Afghanistan. One is central and one is the one is uh, eastern and one is uh, southern Afghanistan. And we hope to establish around five more schools in different provinces. Right now we have Yalda School and Soraya School and both of them have around 100 learners. Both of them come on daily basis, on weekly basis. They learn uh, room, uh, from Rumi Bites. They right now uh, even are learning from Rumi Bites. And um, the number of course is even right now high on the Rumi side in Pashto and Dari and including English because the girls do love to learn in English. And since then, we are hoping, we are right now in the middle of developing curriculum that would be used in Bytes um, for the girls. And since this is the one of those sites that is easily loaded when you click on it, so you don't need a lot of internet for it. And the fun thing is when you give Rumi feedback, they actually work on it. So when I told Rumi that, um, yeah, there's a huge problem with internet. What do we do? Um, so what they did was uh, actually uh, talk about the downloading of the byte. So now if you go on the Rumi site, if you love a byte and you think you won't have internet later on, you can just download it in a PDF. And this is the most useful tool or um, the feature that we have in uh, Rumi right now where the girls, they go to school and they learn through the bytes, but they also download it. So 
post that if they could be using it for learning or maybe if they want to convert it to some other uh, USB or for their desktop and stuff like that. So that's the most useful feature that we have right now. We are teaching them STEM through Rumi. We are teaching them life skills through Rumi. We have another group of 40 commandos who are actually rescued from Afghanistan and they are in the US and they're all, uh, all grown up women, but they have never been to a Western country and they don't know how to like you know carry on with their lives for example how to register for license or uh, how does like you know where how to work on amazon or like you know order on amazon or maybe how to uh, make a cover letter and the fun thing is we use rumi to teach them on how to make a resume how to talk how to network how to order on amazon how to make a gmail so we are balancing the two things right now we are teaching girls on the ground but we are also focusing on women in uh, in the US who were rescued and who were Afghan refugees. And can you move to the next slide? So this is the picture of post-2021 August. And this is probably, I think, uh, in October or September. This is the first time when we started the school. And this is the time where we uh, were, like, you know, out of the 7,000 students, the only ones that we contacted showed up. So I think for me, this will be always be my proud picture because um, the whole world can be a messed up place. Everything can go down, but there is some sort of like, you know, resilience, but also there is this sort of bravery in young Afghan girls. I wouldn't say like women or men or whatever, because that's a different category. Those people have lived their life. They have a support system. These are young girls we are talking about who are always picked last, but these girls showed up to these classes where we were teaching them through digital literacy and they were there. So for me, this is the, I take pride in this picture to be honest yeah can you go to the next slide so this is the pictures that i got recently from the school in yalda and in uh, in uh, suraya so the picture on my right is actually uh, students who are learning a uh, picture on my right is a girl learning on how to create a gmail through rumi so she's actually creating gmail if you zoom in and the picture on my left is girls learning uh, on uh, how to use rumi uh, through their um, teacher who's actually in herat and they are teaching them in uh, Kabul. <laughs> so the, that's the Yalla school. So this is the last, but also this is a hope for me. This is a hopeful picture. And I would like to end my um, uh, presentation on this one thing that there are a lot of things that can go wrong about Afghanistan. There are a lot of people who can go wrong about Afghanistan. But one thing that I love the most is the fact that um, these girls are showing up and Rumi, uh, Rumi stood by them and they're learning and Rumi is helping them learn. So for me, that will always be something, a sense of uh, honor, but also some sort of thing that I would take pride in because I, we were all able to do this for them and it will continue to grow. So, yeah, and I'll end it here. Yeah. Pashtana, thank you so much for the work that you're doing with Learn Afghanistan. We're really proud to partner with you. So it's been great to reminisce about what we've all accomplished in the past year. We're now going to look at the future of learning. We'll see how Rumi plays a part in learning in 2022 and beyond. We have Dr. Nancy Miller, our Director of Learning, and Nadira Chand, our Head of Education Sales and Partnerships. Thanks, Steve. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this afternoon. I'm Nadira. As Steve mentioned, I'm the head of educational sales and partnerships, and I'm sharing the stage today with Dr. Nancy Miller. Nancy. Thank you, Nadira. And I'm Nancy, uh, the director of learning. And Nadira, my colleague, and I love to speak about the future of learning. But of course, none of us can see into the future. We can only forecast what might happen based on what's happening now. And whenever I hear the word future, I can't help to think of this reoccurring theme in New Yorker cartoons, uh, and that's time machines. So time machines are this motif that reappear, and they often carry a future self who lands in the present to warn people, often themselves, not to write an email or to avoid eating the scallops. But in this particular cartoon, a Paleolithic man emerges from his time capsule to warn his wife and brother that nothing really changes in the next hundred years. Of course, as modern people, 
we no longer have that problem. We have other problems. Things change far too quickly, sometimes at a rate in which we can't keep up with or even track. So if look at the next slide. There's a quote from the futurist Alvin Toffler. And uh, he writes in his book, Future Shock, that we have not merely extended the scope and scale of change, we have radically altered its pace. It influences our sense of time, revolutionizes the tempo of daily life, and affects the very way we feel the world around us. And some of you may be familiar with this writer, Al Alvin Toffler, he's a famous futurist. And apart from his predictions of flying cars and paper wedding gowns, or those may still come into vogue. <laughs> Many of the forecasts that Toffler wrote about 40 years ago have come true. So the world is more transient. Knowledge has become our fuel and we are owning less and sharing more. Toffler's main interest, however, is how people can prepare to cope with the accelerated pace of change. When things change faster than our brains can handle, we feel overwhelmed. After all, we just looked at the Paleolithic ancestors whose brain history we share. And for them, nothing really changed. But for us, things are changing all the time. So one of the most important things that a modern learner can do is learn how to adapt, to learn, unlearn, and relearn. So if the past two years is testament to how important this skill is to learn, to unlearn, and relearn. And it's normal for the modern learner to feel easily distracted, overwhelmed, and impatient. Yeah, the world is changing, they're adapting. And as facilitators of their learning, we can help learners not only by understanding what they go through, uh, the trends in their behavior, the cultural context, but also considering what, how can we really best provide for them, adapt to their behaviors, and create the best learning experiences possible. So one of the solutions that Rooney offers is its growing library of mobile-first micro-learning, or bytes as we call them. Each byte teaches a single concept and easy to understand steps that travel with learners and not against them. Learners can consume bytes on their, at their own pace, and Rumi makes it easy by offering credible, manageable chunks of learning that put less load on cognition and make the journey fun. So learners go on their own micro learning adventures. And we're gonna go on an adventure right now uh, through a bite that we've created for you on the modern learner. Right, so. If you can see it on your screen, is it big enough for everyone? So maybe, when was the last time you sought to learn something new? Rumi Bites often begin with a question like this to hook the reader in or the learner in. Maybe you searched online for the perfect recipe uh, for rosemary focaccia. And we have a gif of, uh, gif of a recipe there. Or maybe you uh, wanted to learn a new skill like how to hula hoop. So where did you go to learn that new thing? Did you Google it? Did you uh, ask how to? Did you watch a tutorial on YouTube? Or did you go to the hive mind on Twitter? Or maybe, if you know us, you roomied it. A veritable in-pocket trainer, your smartphone is often your ticket to learn. It holds libraries of learning material, collections of courses, galleries of images, stacks of digital books. Uh, as Nancy mother, goes, yeah. Sorry, as Nancy goes through this bite, I'm just going to break down some of the makeup um, and some of the thought process that's gone into it. So this introduction piece is where we would outline our learning objective for what's to come in the bite. Um, you'll notice also we're chunking information in just a few simple, easy to understand languages, nothing too heavy on the jargon or anything like that. Um, and we like to add a lot of memes, uh, GIFs and memes to uh, help underscore some of the contents we're going through. Hmm. And that goes back to the point that we made on, it reduces the load on cognition. It makes it easier to learn, especially when a learner is on the go and distracted. 
So matter, no matter who you are, if you live in a, the modern world, you're a modern learner, you may be overwhelmed uh, by, with information, chat apps, news apps, networking apps, uh, notifications upon notifications, nudges to take more footsteps, reminders to practice gratitude, what's up on WhatsApp. And as you can see in that GIF, there's a little bit of an anxious scroller there looking at her phone. Accessing information is rarely an issue, but assessing it in the modern world is more of a problem. And if you can see, there's a link there. Uh, we have a bite linked to this bite on how to assess information online, which is a growing issue and concern for the modern learner. You also get answer. You also want answers and get them when you want them. You Google, Quora, Reddit. However you ask the question, the often the only thing that lies between you and the answer is the sp speed of your broadband. So we have a yogi, modern yogi, maybe a modern learner as well, on her phone as she does uh, the sun salutations. You're on the move. You, if you want to learn something, you make it happen. On the bus, in the locker room, at the dog park, no single institution lays claim to your curiosity. And so you see another link there, and that links learners to uh, an entire library we have dedicated to learning how to learn. And we can also add in, did you know nuggets, pieces of information to help break up some of the content? Um, this one here, did you know 80% of the world's population uses smartphones? An average smartphone user taps into their mobile 221 times a day. 30% of those people use mobile for on-the-go learning. Right. And the modern learner also likes things their way. You live in an era of personalization. From your coffee to your newsfeed, most things these days are tailored to your tastes and your preferences. You march to the beat of your own drum, and when you walk past the local Starbucks, you also want an extra foamy almond milk cappuccino with your name on it. And that's the same uh, with learning. You want learning as you like it. So bending to someone else's schedule, uh, our itinerary doesn't always work with you. Uh, you may have two jobs in two different countries or homeschool your three-year-old golden doodle. Here we have a call out, a quiz. Um, these will be placed throughout the bite to just kind of gauge your understanding of the concepts we've covered so far. Um, personalized learning might include lessons catered to your interests, lessons that you have say in, learning at your own pace, and if we understand what Nancy's been talking about so far. We know it's all of the above. And uh, as we pointed out, uh, modern learners are also social and your friends and colleagues are modern learners. You're on Slack, LinkedIn, and Miro. You share spreadsheets on the cloud. You have a study buddy who mentions you on TikTok and pushes you to get your groove on. So as you can see, we like to make learning fun and in, uh, works in concert with social media. You're collaborative. Every day, there's another tool to pool resources to work jointly, and pathways of learning frequently cross. Your colleagues are your teachers, your students, and your peers. They're on Instagrams, and someone may ping you with a tech tip off or another post of pie baking hat. So learning is happening everywhere. Um, another another uh, follows your climate action hashtag uh, and shares your edgy meme. So there we have a link to a lesson, a, a bite on climate change. And our final quiz at the bottom of the uh, bite, again, just to kind of gauge your understanding. And for us on the back end, we can kind of pull up some metrics to see if you've made it through to the bottom of the bite. But which of the following is not a benefit of collaborative learning? Choose the best answer. Models practice and cooperation, develop social systems reports, increase the self-esteem and improves recall. Yeah, and you can read a little bit more about that. We'll send you this bite in a link. But just to wrap up the bite, there's always an action step. So that's an opportunity to summarize the learning and also give uh, the learner some real life activities they can do to take the learning into their lives, into the world and uh, retain the information better. So here we challenge learners to learn on the move this week. Uh, asking them what skill they can improve throughout the day with the aid of their mobile phone. 
What are some of the things you want to learn but think you just don't have time for? So sneak in a few moments of micro learning today. And are you learning through social media? Are you collaborating with others? Join online forums dedicated to tools that intrigue you, or dedicated to, yeah, topics that intrigue you. And we also just wanted to shout out our Discord community down here at the bottom because our, the modern learner also requires a digital community where they can share their learning experiences with others. And we have fostered that community as well at Rumi. Um, so we're gonna jump back into our PowerPoint. Just to touch a little bit on, um, you know, the modern learner and how learning is changing. And learning used to be seen as a long-term process which required consistency, repetition, and time to settle. And while all of that is still true, the reality is that the modern learner is much more impatient and expects shorter learning cycles. And this cannot be more apparent as we evaluate the impact of TikTokers and Instagram influencers, and that the popularity of social media comes back to the shortness of its content. So we need to reach learners where they are, and, the, and, and we understand that the modern learner needs to see the applicability and value of learning to them instantly, and learning to be engaging and fun like social media. To complement the points on the modern learner, we also need to evaluate how access to technology in the classroom will continue to grow. Schools will continue to do away with traditional textbooks, replacing them with digital versions. versions. Cultivating this learning environment will ask that teachers and school boards update and upskill the curriculum. We're happy to share that we are working in tandem with higher education and K-12 spaces to introduce our micro-learning courses, our bites. We have different levels of partnerships, so many teachers are interested in learning how to make a bite and introducing the content into their classroom. Bites encourage collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking, which are elements of learning that need constant updates. As we wrap up here, we really wanted to encourage you to share the bite on the modern learner on your social media platforms, uh, like, share, comment on the Rumi page as well. And we're also interested in hearing about how you plan on using the bites um, moving forward in your classroom. Yeah, and we just have one more slide to wrap up. Uh, there's a great resource that we'll send you in a follow-up email, the five traits of the modern learner. And you can interact with this resource and learn a little bit more about the modern learner and how Rumi is serving the modern learner. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thanks to Nancy and Nadira for that look into the future. And let's talk a little bit about the modern learner and Rumi's impact on those learners. We have with us Kami Valkova, our community manager, who's been running our Discord server, and Mary Ellen Dintino, uh, one of our longest serving learning design volunteers. Thanks so much, Steve. I'm so excited to share more about our community today. While the Rumi Byte Library is a fantastic resource, one piece we still needed was a space where learners could actually connect with one another to provide and receive support with their learning. And that's where the Discord community came in. It's the social extension of the library where members can come to discuss topics like their job search strategy, their interviewing, their resume, their networking, how to navigate a challenging conversation, really anything that falls under that umbrella of things you probably didn't learn in school. Members can participate here in the text channels asynchronously, sharing bites and wisdom and words of support no matter where they are in their career or their learning journey. And one of my personal favorite channels is the Share Your Win channel, which is focused on highlighting members' successes from getting the interview or the job to holding a boundary in a relationship or achieving an academic goal, whatever it might be. And we also like to host live events on the voice channels that are casual, but they continue to extend the roomy learning. In our weekly lunch and learn sessions, for example, um, they are like a miniature book club. We read a bite for the week and then we have a conversation about it. And a short five minute bite can spark a conversation that can easily last an hour or more. We also like to connect members of all sorts of different ages and interests and from all over the world. And in one recent Lunch and Learn session, we were actually fortunate to have members from Asia, Europe, Africa, and North America all on the same call. Um, I, I now like to introduce you actually to a few of our over 1400 members to illustrate the direct and significant impact that your support has on real people around the world. 
Up first, I have Steffi. Steffi started her Rooney journey as a volunteer learning designer, creating bikes for the library. And she has since expanded her involvement to be a paid consultant for Rumi as well. She's an active member of the Discord community, and there she got support throughout her career change journey. Uh, through those conversations that she had in the community, she found her confidence and her voice, and she's now actually an education tech student and a professional in children's media. And she's also doing an internship in product design. She is pretty busy nowadays. Um, on the next slide, I'll also introduce you to Eun So. Yunso is another active member of our community. She's a high school student in the Philippines, and she came to Rumi as a learning designer and now is also an active contributor and even a moderator in the Discord server. Through learning with Rumi, Yunso puts her knowledge right back into the community. She's always there to welcome new members, to provide feedback about the server from the learner perspective, and also to be a really great resource for folks who this might be their first time learning about this stuff, and she can actually relate. And on the final slide, I also have one more person I'd like to introduce you to. This is Nova. She came into the Discord community last year. She was completely <laughs> overwhelmed. She was a recent graduate looking for jobs, and she was starting to actually feel a little bit hopeless and unsure about how to proceed. But with the support of the community, she felt less alone, and she was actually able to see her potential. And with the resume and interview prep feedback she received, she landed two jobs. And to this day, she's an active member of the community. I'll now pass it off to Mary Ellen, who, as Steve mentioned, is one of our longest standing volunteers and community members. So you'll get to hear from her directly. Hi there. Thank you, Cami. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. I'm really happy to be able to speak to you for a few minutes today about my experience as a volunteer instructional designer at Rumi. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've had a couple of careers already. I've been a counselor, a social worker. More recently, I've been an administrator for a nonprofit where I still work. I live in New Hampshire in the United States, and I'm an empty nester. So Rumi volunteers really run the gamut from young to old and everything in between and are from all over the world, which is a really exciting part of being a volunteer. A few years ago, I found myself with some job responsibilities at work that really were revolving around a lot of training, designing and delivering it. And I was becoming more and more interested about how I can, could improve my presentations and about how adults learn. So at that time I had gone back to school and I was it was really good timing because I ended up graduating with um, a certificate in instructional design in 2020, right at the height of the pandemic. So as you know, at that time, people were becoming even more and more interested in online learning. So as I was looking for some opportunities, I was really lucky enough to come across an application for Rumi volunteers in one of the Facebook groups that I was involved in. And I applied, was accepted, and I started volunteering in the fall of 2020. And I've been pretty active ever since. I just can't say enough about how much I've enjoyed contributed, contributing to Rumi's mission, making digital learning open and accessible to all people. I'm grateful that I'm able to use my skills that I have where I can um, help others and contribute to a great cause. Some of the bites that I've most enjoyed creating are on mental health topics, some bites that help college students adjust to their freshman year, and um, some of the career related bites. I even wrote an, an educational bite that goes back in time. So Nancy, it's not exactly incorporating a time machine, but that is, that is one of my goals. I, I wanna uh, create a bite with a time machine. Um, and the point is that it's just a really creative process, a lot of fun and um, a great experience to be a um, volunteer at Rumi. Um, to date, I think I've created 25 or more bytes, and one of the things I'm most proud about is that a few of my bytes were translated into Persian for use by Learn Afghanistan. Um, Rumi has benefited me professionally as well. Um, being new to the field of instructional design, it gave me real-life hands-on experience and credibility. Um, we have a peer review process that's very robust so that I could learn from others and they could learn from me. Um, it's helped me to gain my confidence in a new career. Um, I, I was even given support when I started my own business. 
uh, last year. Um, and I'm just very, very appreciative for everyone from the staff to the other learning designers and everyone that I've come in contact with. Um, I wanted to just finish up by saying what a few of my um, favorite bites are. So there are many, many, and I look at them all the time and I share them with my family and friends, but three favorites are um, what are NFTs? I've shared that with many people who had no idea. Uh, learn to play spike ball, which is a fun one. And uh, what can I do with my stack of used devices? Thank you so much, Mary Ellen and Cami, for your involvement in our learning community, as well to any volunteers who are, are watching right now. We really appreciate your commitment to Bytes and to our learners. And we'll now speak to Cassandra Rivera from the Teen Tech Center and the Clubhouse Network. These are two organizations that work closely with our learning audience. Thank you, Steve. So hi, good morning, afternoon, depending on where you're at. My name is Cassandra Rivera, and I was at, uh, invited by Rumi to speak to you all today um, about my kind of experience being a lifelong learner, lifelong learner in addition to um, the work that I've done with youth, in different parts of the United States, and then finally some of the collaboration that I've done with Rumi. So um, when thinking about putting together this presentation, I wasn't quite sure where to start, but after having a couple of conversations with um, some different folks at Rumi, and just kind of talking a little bit about my all of my experiences, um, we kind of decided the best, the best place to start would be at the very beginning. So I'm gonna try to keep this uh, relatively short. Uh, I don't know how you can pack an entire life uh, into just a few minutes, but um, I'll try to give you guys the condensed version. And then I hope to um, give you guys kind of a, a, a better idea of how all this kind of comes together in my current role as the, the program manager for career readiness at the Clubhouse Network. So let's take it way back. Uh, I was born and raised in Chicago. Um, I'm a city girl uh, by nature. Um, you know, I, I'm from a mixed race background, uh, which includes Latin American and African American. Um, and I was really fortunate um, in that I had the opportunity to go to a lot of really great public schools, which isn't always the case uh, in the United States. Um, you know, it can be really hit or miss depending on um, the neighborhood that you live in, the demographics that you come from, et cetera. But I was really fortunate um, that I went to schools where we had a lot of educators that really cared um, about, you know, us being literate and knowing different things and very much introducing us to arts and culture early on. So some of my fondest memories of, you know, being in, in middle and elementary school are our entire school going to school plays downtown or going to the Museum of Science and Industry or the Field Museum. And so, you know, all those experiences really helped um, me cultivate a love for learning and education that would manifest later uh, in my journey. And so, you know, I went to high school, um, you know, had a lot of great experiences there. And uh, I had a really great art teacher um, who suggested that I do uh, my first internship with an organization in the city called Gallery 37, which was a really great opportunity. Um, she thought I was really talented at art and wanted to see me kind of explore that a little bit more. So my very first job was a paid summer internship where I learned traditional animation. And it was just awesome. I got to take public transit um, to go downtown and work with a cohort of youth that were also interested in animation and really got to apprentice and learn under people that had been doing it for years. So that was kind of me dipping my toe in. I did another program when I was uh, getting ready to graduate from high school uh, in partnership with the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, where you know we learned about Frida Kahlo and her contemporaries. And that's why you see the little Frida Kahlo uh, postage stamp on my slides there. Um, but we learned about her contemporaries, um, folks that were doing art around the same time, but that were lesser known, and built these really amazing um, handcrafted magazines that we shared back with the community. And so a lot of my early years were spent um, in arts and education. And I think that really kind of uh, steered me in the direction I ended up going. So, you know, uh, for, for uh, college, I ended up going to the Illinois Institute of Art. I studied visual effects and motion graphics and earned my Bachelor of Fine Art uh, and graduated in 2010, which unfortunately was two years after the Great Recession uh, in uh, the United States. And so it was really actually kind of difficult to find a job in my industry. And in addition to that, I had done an internship right before um, I left school and it was in a post-production house. And so 
while I was super excited to work with other professionals and do you know really cool effects, um, I wasn't thrilled with the fact that we were mostly working on McDonald's and beer commercials. Um, and you know, growing up, in addition to having really great educators in public schools, I also spent a lot of time watching shows like Sesame Street and just different educational programming uh, from public access TV. And so that also really influenced um, the things I wanted to do with my creativity. And so, you know, I found myself at a point where, you know, I thought, well, it would be nice if I could apply this to education. I'm just not sure how. And so I spun my, I spun my wheels for a little bit. And then it just so happened that uh, my brother was doing national service in, in California, and he recommended doing uh, City Year, which is a national service program where you go into schools, underserved schools, and you support youth with attendance, behavior, and course performance. And so I said, why not? Let's give that a shot. So I actually ended up moving states, uh, moved from uh, Chicago to Colorado, um, did two years of national service, one where I was supporting uh, in classroom with teachers, and then uh, the second year where I came back as a team leader and, and worked with core members to support youth. And we did a lot of things in the classroom, but we also had a lot of activities and other things that we used to get, engage youth and students outside of the classroom. And so what I discovered from that, once my time of service was uh, coming to an end, that I really loved working with young people. I really loved education, but I didn't like doing it in a traditional academic setting. And so uh, that's kind of where I made a segue into nonprofit. And so, you know, I ended up with a really excellent nonprofit in uh, Colorado, um, and they happen to be tied to the Clubhouse Network, which is where I'm currently employed. And so um, I started uh, my time there as a mentor coordinator, where I brought in different educators, different professionals to work with our youth in a non-formal uh, environment. Did that for about two and a half years. And then I transitioned um, as our funder, our primary funder transitioned from Intel to Best Buy. Best Buy brought along with it this really great idea about doing a career readiness program. And so I transitioned to being uh, the facilitator for that program. I did that for three years. And then right around 2019, uh, when the pandemic hit, it was really fascinating because one of the big emphasis that I had with our young people was uh, workplace technology. And so while we were in person, I still had them making Gmail accounts. We used Slack. And so when the pandemic hit, it actually wasn't too hard of a transition for them to move to a virtual space because we had already been using it throughout the year. And so, um, you know, I wrapped up that year in Colorado. And then as a result of the pandemic, I decided I really wanted to to, to come back to the, the Midwest and Chicago and the area where I was born and raised. And so I made a lateral move. I moved to Detroit, Michigan, um, did, doing the same role because uh, the Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation had received the same grant that they had in Colorado to do career readiness. So I made a lateral move there. Um, and while there, um, I ended up having to do the same programming that I had done, you know, for the last three years, 100% virtual. So enter Rumi. Um, I had a really great partner uh, through Best Buy that introduced me to Rumi. Uh, they told me all about um, just the wonderful things they are doing in terms of learning and micro learning, and I was all about it. So I got an introduction. Um, I got to learn a little bit more about what um, what what Rumi was all about, um, and so. I just want to talk a little bit about kind of my experience with that. So if we could go to the next slide. So personally, I feel like we're at a turning point with education at the intersection of technology. And what I think is really great about Rumi is that they're, they're really interested in filling that gap for young people. So as I mentioned earlier on in my presentation, I had really great resources growing up, but I'm well aware that not a lot of youth do. And so what's really great about Rumi, and it's been spoken about earlier in this presentation, is that they're really great at kind of filling in the gap. I also really appreciated the fact that um, they're open to feedback. When I first started to talking to them, they were talking about micro learning, and it was kind of more of a broad uh, net that they were casting. And one of my suggestions was, well, why don't you guys focus on youth? And they took that and ran with it. Um, and as a result, you know, I ended up doing some bite workshops with my youth in Detroit. Um, I still use bites and share them on our Slack channel with our facilitators. Um, and it's just been a really, really great experience working with Rumi. And I think the last thing that I want to mention uh, before I wrap up that's been really awesome about working with Rumi is um, just how they're really great at creating virtual spaces that are appealing to young people. We live in a highly uh, visual uh, technology time period where it's not enough just to kind of have kids open a book. And so I really appreciate that Rumi has done a, 
excellent job of incorporating uh, GIFs and uh, memes and different things to make their content really appealing. So overall, I, you know, I'm super excited about where things are going and I can't wait to see what happens next with Romy. Thank you, Cassandra. We really appreciate uh, partnering with you and the networks that you're a part of, and we look forward to more collaborations in the future. Thank you. So looking back on the past year, it's clear that we've had an outsized impact on learners and not to mention just amazing growth. We've had so many more people choosing to engage with Bytes and joining our Discord server. So as we look towards the future, we're really excited about where we're going, but really we can't do it without you. We're, we're grateful to you for your continued support and your interests, and we look forward to accomplishing even bigger things together. Thanks to all of you for attending today and to our speakers as well. We've got about 10 minutes to do some Q&A before we head into the networking session. So now's your chance to interact with us. If you have a question, please drop it into the comments and we'll pick a few questions and uh, uh, pose them to our, uh, our guests. And in the meantime, as we wait for some, some questions to come out, I'd like to bring on, on Tarek. Uh, Tarek, I just want to know, You've been taking the message of Rumi to a lot of places around the world. Uh, what kind of response are you getting from the people you talk to when you introduce them to the idea of Rumi? Uh, thanks, Steve. It's, it's a really interesting question because um, in some sense, so first of all, the momentum is accelerating significantly. And the sense I get, um, last I mentioned in the beginning, I started my career doing uh, finance for the tech sector. Um, what I didn't mention is that it was in the dot com bubble, but I didn't catch the the amazing party. I actually like I caught the the hangover, I guess you could say. I mean, it crashed, and I started to realize, you know, one thing that's really important with technology um, that is often easy to miss is that the mo is the timing is more important than anything else, right? I mean, obviously things have to be capable. You have to be able to build them. There was a technological sort of question around that. But usually timing is the most important thing. And what we've seen in the last, you know, now close 10 years since the beginning of Rumi was a very, very steady amount of growth over years. And you, can, you kind of see that happening because people are slowly adopting uh, technology. And, and what we've noticed in the last couple of years, and obviously it's the pandemic and other things have contributed to it, but it's this growing understanding that not only do we need digital learning, I mean, that goes without saying, I mean, the pandemic showed it, but we already knew before that that done well, it's very efficient. There's this growing understanding that, um, you know, impact and reach and, you know, doing the things that we want to do in, in this space really requires understanding the learner and understanding that it's not enough for us to lecture them and say, well, young people have short attention spans and, you know, this or that and lament it. Um, you know, we need to actually listen and understand the fact that, you know, they're all just as capable or arguably more uh, more so and and they you know they'll succeed if we actually listen to them and have a bottoms up approach that empowers them because we understand that truly if you can engage learners you know you can get you know you, you start to really uh, get through to them and give them the tools they need and so i would say the biggest thing i've noticed is is, is, is this change particularly in the last year where people are starting to realize that um, we need to look at digital models and we need to be very creative and thinking about how the modern learner actually wants to learn and does learn. And that, um, you know, that from the perspective of timing, I would say that um, it, we're really at that inflection point now. And I'd say in the next few years, we, you know, we're, we're really excited about growing it massively around the world in different languages, different cultures to start to address, um, you know, a, a, a gap that, you know, that hasn't been addressed, but if done well, can, can have tremendous impact. Well, that's, it's really interesting to, to note that shift. And actually this ties into a question from Jason. So I'm going to bring that up on the screen. So Tarek, you can, we can, we can read that question out and you can answer it if you like. Uh, Jason asks, I'm curious about, you know, what would superpower Ruby's work? What kind of partnerships will be most impactful in this next phase? Thank you, Jason, for your question. Uh, so thanks, Jason. I, I, uh, it's a great question, actually. I think right now that the, the most um, the simplest way to think about it is that we're not uh, just a tech startup or a tech platform. We're really a movement, right? And that movement is from people who have skills and knowledge to give, right? Like Mary Ellen and, and lots of people who are 
contributing their time, um, you know, very admirably to, to, to build a resource that contributes to humanity. In that sense, it's like Wikipedia, but uh, I promise you are, um, we're much more inclusive. Our, our, our uh, volunteer group is, is uh, much more diverse, more, more female than male and so on, also a better interface. But you can see you can have you can harness the energy of people to to really contribute. You have on the other hand, side learners, right? And they're the ones growing, and it's it's we're increasingly changing the formula so it really works for them. And so at the end of the day, what it is really is just a digital platform that's enabling a, a skills transfer, right? A digital skills transfer from people who have knowledge and want to contribute to those who have the most to gain, and often have traditionally uh, not received access. So. With all of that being said, I think that there's room for additional volunteers who want to contribute. There's always room for additional learners or institutions that can help promote and get it to more learners, right? Because like anything else, it, it's free, it's open, it's great, but you know, people need to know that it exists. Um, and the growth rate, you know, 10 times year over year is great. It could be, you know, Bogdan will be sweating in the tech team, but it could be a hundred times, right? I mean, you know, we, we can scale the server capacity, we can drive as much impact as as uh, as required and it's really just finding the kinds of partners that really can contribute and often that's companies right there's a lot of great companies that do work that uh really contributes to making the world a better place and to being sustainable um i don't think every company necessarily does that there but there are definitely great ones in there that are and, and i think recognizing and working with them uh, in, a, in a broader ecosystem that we're you know institutions and, and, and people can plug in in different ways to amplify the message is really where we want to go with this. Thank you so much, Tarek. Really appreciate those answers and uh, really appreciate those questions as well from our audience. I'm going to bring up uh, Cassandra. So Cassandra, I'm actually curious to know, like, how do you actually use Rumi to, to work with, with the youth that are part of your networks? Yeah, I'm really glad. Yeah. So I have a little bit of a formula for it. Um, so when, when doing um, work virtually, which is what I did last year uh, in Detroit, I like to use Rumi to um, kind of set the context for what we're going to be discussing. So, you know, I have all of my youth on Slack, um, you know, I do regular announcements um, and youth kind of know the topics we're going to cover ahead of time. And so what I really like to do is go, go into the Byte library and take a look at kind of what matches the topic that we're going to be covering that particular day. Um, and then I share that uh, via Slack. I, you know, I love that it pops up with a visual. It has the link right there. Sometimes I'll provide a little bit of extra context on how I want youth to use it. Um, and then I have them go through the bite and then we, we, you know, we jump into the topic and then now they've had some additional kind of context. Another way that I've liked using it too is going through a bite live together. So, you know, I'll pop open a bite on my screen while we're on a, on a Zoom call, I'll share my screen and we'll take turns popcorn reading it almost like a textbook and then have everyone do the quizzes together. Um, and again, it's just a really fun way of having youth kind of take what the topics we're learning a step further. It's been super helpful with uh, career development, uh, which is kind of kind of what I'm focusing on right now. So um, yeah, that's just some examples of how I like to use Rumi with my young people. That's great, Cassandra. It sounds like uh, you've got a bit of a flipped flipped classroom technique happening there. That's fantastic. Any teachers out there watching, you know, I encourage you to to try the same activities with your with your students. Uh, we've got now a question from Ruby, so we're going to bring on Nancy to answer this question. Uh, thanks, Ruby, for your question. Uh, Ruby wants to know, I'm interested in learning more about the research and data behind Byte Learning. It's all fascinating. Ruby has been inspiring since its inception. Hard agree, Ruby, hard agree. Thank you for that observation. <laughs> Nancy, what would you like to uh, to, to contribute to that, uh, to that question? Yeah. Thank you, Ruby, for that question. And we're continually learning here at, at Rumi. We're really interested in the science of learning and especially, of course, micro learning. So there's going to be a, a white paper coming out soon that, that will be available so you can dive yourself a little bit deeper. And all of this, you know, it, it all feeds into micro learning is related to the culture and uh, young people and technology. So there's so many different facets of our research. And as a team, we all have different strengths in which we contribute to that research. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Nancy. And thank you as well, Ruby. 
Uh, we have a comment from Instagram. So the comment from Instagram is uh, from Samia. Do you have any services in Canada? And I'm going to pass that one over to Cami. Sure. Thanks so much, Steve, for passing it over to me. Um, that's a great question. I mean, the great part about the Discord community is we can literally reach anyone in any country and any part of the world. Uh, so absolutely, we also do include Canada in that picture. So we also in our, I mean, Steve, you manage the learning designer community. We also have volunteers who come to us from all over the world, which also includes Canada. Um, and then in terms of our learners, like I know that um, Nadira has been working really hard to make partnerships happen with um, folks in Canada of um, uh, getting into classrooms. So we're, we're making headway there. So I would say it's oh, the community is your best place to come in if it's your first time kind of interacting with us just because you can interact with us in real time, drop your question, and we'll make sure to get you connected with the right person. If you're looking for a very specific service, just feel free to pop in and just let us know exactly what you're looking for. Um, we'll make sure we can make it happen. Thanks, Cami. And also, I just wanted to mention that we, you know, we do partner or we can partner with with school boards or board levels uh, for partnerships uh, here in Toronto or even North America. And uh, Mary Ellen uh, would like to uh, mention a, a project as well. Yes, um, one of the one of the groups that Rumi has worked with in the past is called the Rural Mental Health Wellness Project, which is in Canada. And some, it was a special project where we were asked to create bites for um, mental health related bites for that organization. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Okay, so yeah, we are we are a Canadian organization, so we do work with a lot of uh, local organizations. So we work with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. Um, they're uh, they they own the uh, our, our our sports franchises like the Toronto Maple Leafs and and uh, Toronto Raptors, World Champions 2019. Can't forget that. Um, they have uh, youth programs called Lunch Launchpad, uh, where we work with some of their 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 youth members uh, in a similar fashion to the way that Cassandra is working with people through through the Clubhouse network. But we are, you know, happy to uh, to move to uh, international organizations to work with. Uh, and I think we've got one more question here. I'm going to ask. Let's see. I'm going to ask one more question about partnerships and how organizations fit together. So, if you know Pashtana or or uh, 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 Cassandra, if you want to speak to how your organization and Rumi fit together, you know, how, what was it that drew you to Rumi in the first place? Pashana, you can go ahead. All right. So I think with Rumi, I think the, the fact that they put a trust in a very young organization that was still taking baby steps and not a lot of people like, you know, believed in the, in the idea, but again, uh, we're crazy at learn and then there were people crazy at Ruby, so there, it, it was a good fit. But apart from that, on a practicality level, I think um, uh, Rumi always caters to the needs uh, of the organization. For example, what we needed, uh, technical support or let's say uh, digital support or devices support, or maybe sometimes even exposure. I was never this famous. When I was not famous, Rumi was actually trying to get me uh, exposed to places where I needed to talk about digital literacy in Afghanistan. Um, and I think that's something that uh, as an organization one needs uh, is to grow, but grow together and also provide the right, uh, like, you know, opportunities. So that has always been the case with Rumi and that's the reason it will always be my favorite learning platform. And I think for me, what's what's been most appealing about working with Rumi is just how well our missions align. So, you know, the Clubhouse Network basically provides physical space for youth, not just in the United States, but all around the world. We're like a free drop-in maker space for youth. Um, and our learning model is super open. Um, you know, youth are encouraged to um, follow their interests and, you know, like learn by design. And all of these things are things that Rumi does and does well. And so I'm just really excited to kind of see the evolution of their platform, the evolution of their Byte library and all the different ways that they're building community, because it really aligns very well with the community that we are, the physical communities that we already have with the Clubhouse Network. Um, 
our different sites across the world um, and just creating uh, safe spaces for young people to learn, gain life skills and then take those life skills out into the world and be super successful. And, you know, we primarily serve youth from underserved communities here in the United States. Um, and so I think that's that's a big factor for us too, right? Like it's accessible. You can send someone a bite and they can they can learn. They don't need to have a souped up computer or um, all, all the materials. But if they did need those things, they could always come into one of our, our Best Buy Teen Tech Centers or our clubhouses. But in lieu of that, as you know, the pandemic has shown, we need to be able to pivot and also be able to do things virtually. And I think Rumi is a really great way to have youth continue learning so that when they are able to come back into our spaces, they're coming in armed with all of this wonderful knowledge so they can use our 3D printers, use our music studio, use all of that stuff. And so that, uh, that continuum of learning really kind of uh, goes from beginning to end. And I think Rumi is a great part of that. All right. Well, thanks to both of you. You know, we're, we're both happy that we will be part of that evolution and we're looking to partner with more organizations. So if you're interested, please check out our website, roomy.org. I believe you can email us at info at uh, And I think we have just one more question for Tarek. Uh, there's a question about how is Rumi funded? Is it by sponsorships, in-kind donations? Uh, you, can, you can go ahead, Tarek. Uh, well, the answer is all of the above. So uh, Rumi is Canadian and U.S. registered as a 501c3 and as a Canadian registered charity. So, um, you know, we uh, in that sense, we're I, I use the Wikipedia example a lot, but but it's partly to convey the idea that we're building a, a massive public resource that's driven around a movement of people um, who are contributing the knowledge and skills they have to, you know, to to empower people around the world. And it's and again, it's all it's all nonprofit. It's all um, really with a goal of of empowering people to realize their potential. And so, we're always looking for funding either as individuals. You could you know just like you we hopefully give a few bucks to Wikipedia for making encyclopedias uh, free, or uh, institutions, whether um, corporate backers or or uh, foundations or governments. Um, it's really a mix of all of those uh, who want to who want to you know back the mission, and and empower education in a way that's digital and scalable and, and fast. All right. Well, thanks, Tarek. Thanks to all of our speakers. And we're now going to move to our networking sessions. So I'm just going to post a link in the session. You need to open up your hop-in window. Uh, you should be able to see on the left side, you'll see a tab called Sessions. You just need to click on it and join one of those sessions. And we'll be there to see you and network with you. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining. And we'll see you in the session rooms.